Now, Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. We are going to get right into this one. We have got, of course, Alan Niven on the phone. Bonjour, Alain. How are you? Bonjour. Comment ça va? Comment ça? Très bien. Très bien, because we have an old friend of yours, photographer uh, Mark Weiss. Uh, the new book is The Decade That Rocked. And uh, just real quick, before we get into this whole book, Mark... As a fan in growing up in the 80s, there were just a few people that had these iconic pictures. You know, there was you and there was a couple others. And just thank you for those because you captured some of the memories that ended up on my bedroom wall and the living room wall and uh, just fantastic work. Um, so thank you for that. Thanks. Thanks for enjoying them. And, you know, if it wasn't for you guys buying those magazines, you know, I wouldn't have had a job. Yeah. So... Let, let us get over to this book, the the decade that rocket. Just a great collection of all your your greatest work. Uh, talk to me about getting it put together at first, and who, you know who came up with the idea, and and how did it sort of come about? Well, originally I signed my deal. Believe it or not, it was been seven years in September with Insight Editions, and uh, and originally I, I like I just wanted to do a quick feel good book that that would take like no effort, and it was going to be on just hair bands and like just easy to pull like photos of the first time I shot them or like during like 85, 86 when all the bands were like spiking their hair up with hairspray, like just grab those images and, you know, not a lot of words, not a lot of captions. So I worked on that for about a year, year and a half. And then I'm thinking to myself, uh, do I really want my first book to be like that? You know, cause you know, back then, you know, I was the 80s guy. And then once I hit the 90s, everyone like pigeonholed me as like the hair band photographer, even though I shot harder bands and, you know, not, not just hair bands. So uh, so I didn't want it to be that. I wanted it to be about like my life, how I became a photographer, how I got my first camera, you know, and and just like take it through the 70s, early 73, 70, I think it starts 72 or 73, and then just go towards fast forward through the seventies and then really 1980 when I started working with circus and became, kind of came into my own. And then it was like a solid decade where I just, you know, looking back through my photographs and telling the stories, uh, it just, it's almost like a visual history of really of, of what, however you want to look at it, like the visual history of, of that era of music, that genre. And I just wanted it to be about me and narrative it was like pulling teeth, but I found the right um, writer to work with me after uh, the first one didn't work out. And then, you know, I would just send some my stories in and he would untangle them, Richard Beanstalk. And then uh, I would get it back and I'm like, you didn't do anything. I, and then I took the red line. I looked at the red line. I'm like, oh, he did something, you know, and we just had a really good chemistry working together. And it was just started being fun. But it was it took years to do because I was so like particular and we went through a couple designers and I, I wanted it to be perfect. I, like I started, uh, you know, I'm a little bit of a control guy. So it's like, I wanted it to be my book and they had their ways of doing things. And we, we, we met in the middle, a little bit more on my side to make it to where I wanted it to be. Because like, I, I like I kept telling them, it's like, I'm going to be waking up every day looking at this book. You're not. You'll be on to the next one. So, you know, it was a good good uh, combination with with the company. It really, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, Alan, I'm going to just ask you for a second, because as manager of Great White and Guns N' Roses, you had the choice of whatever you wanted. You could have hired any photographer, but, but you had Mark along for a lot of the rides. What was it about his work and his demeanor around the bands where you said, yeah, I got, this is the guy for us. Well, here's, here's something that people don't necessarily think about, but there are obviously two elements. One element is, is he good with his fucking camera? That's first and foremost. But there's a very subtle and very important element that most people probably wouldn't think about straight away. And that is, do you trust him? And do you like having him around? Because you're basically almost bringing a spy into the house of love. And there has to be a sense of trust there. And there also has to be a willingness to let him shoot what he wants to shoot. 
because, I mean, you know, I got so many giggles looking through the book. I've, I'd forgotten, you know, just how everybody used to suck their cheeks in and do that sort of shoulder forward pose, you know, and the record company would want that. Um, but the really cool photographs are the ones that were not posed and that someone like Mark would see and snap. And you're looking for those, but you're also looking to be dealing with somebody you can trust in that private element. And I got to say, there was a photograph that emerged uh, last week from Mark that just blew me away. Um, mm -hmm. I had no idea of its, its existence. And it's uh, myself and Shelley Shaw from ICM sitting talking with Axel um, backstage somewhere in New York. And it was amazing for me to look at it and, and get a flood of good memories from it. And to look at it and look at the body language and look at the faces and go, yeah, Axe and I had a really good relationship at one point before it was compromised by whoever. But he caught it and it was amazing to see and it was wonderful to see and it was a, and a fabulous piece of documentation. But, you know, that was my criteria. Is he good with his camera? Can he get the standard stuff? But is he someone that I feel comfortable having around uh, in the unguarded moments. And Mark was definitely a cool guy who was cool to hang out with. And he didn't mind him being around with a camera. And by the way, I am one of the world's most notorious camera phobes. So for me to say, I like this guy and I like his camera is a big statement. It really is. So I want to take up on two things that each of you said. Uh, Mark, you said that by the time you got to the 90s, you were sort of like the 80s guy and the industry sort of shun you. And Alan, you said, you know, if the guy's good with a camera, he's good with a camera. So how does a record company or a publicist in the 90s not look at him and go, yeah, OK, he took a picture of Bon Jovi, but fuck it. He's still good with his camera. Why do you think you were cast aside like some of the bands were, Mark? Because it makes no sense to me. You're a talented photographer. It doesn't matter if you're shooting birds, bees, raccoons. You know, uh, Sebastian Bach, if you're yeah. good with the camera, you're good with the camera. It makes no sense. Well, it wasn't really that. You know, it, it, the thing is, like, like the magazines in the 80s were like teeny bop magazines that ended up pinups and, you know, you know, like like David Cassidy's and things. When when the errors changed, um, these bands like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden, which I both I shot like, you know, of course, I'm, it's a new relationship. I like the music. It's rock and roll. Uh and it's got an edge and you know they just didn't seem interested you know like it was like pulling teeth taking pictures with them and you know i try to loosen them up get around and they just it was like a chore like and and they just didn't want they didn't care you know and 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 then god forbid i should tell them that i did stay hungry or slippery when wet you know to impress them which i i did try to loosen them up at some points you know and said you know letting them know a little bit of my history uh and that 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 didn't go well, like with with a few of them, you know. So I like I left that under the under the carpet. But even if I was, um, and the record companies, you know, they always want to see a portfolio, and they have to show the portfolio to the artist. So if they're going to show someone like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden, you know, you know Cinderella and Poison cover and Bon Jovi and whoever else, you know, they're going to say I don't want to use that guy. You know, it just makes sense, but. You know, they, they didn't, I tried to work with some of the magazines like Metal Hammer and it would be like a one-time thing. It's like in the eighties, when I shot a band, I was their friends for life and still am, you know, I'd say 98% that are still living, uh, you know, I'm still friends with and, and, you know, they come, come to town, I hang out, whether they're playing or they're not. And it's just it's something about that era that just, it wasn't cam it was a camera friendly decade after the 80s well it's just strange to me because if i'm this is me but if i'm soundgarden or alice in chains or one of those bands and i go wow he he did the iconic cover for twisted sister he did the iconic cover for you know slippery when wet i'd go i want this guy to make an iconic cover for me i mean that's how i would see it not like oh he did twist it like it, it it's it's bizarre to me uh let me ask you about photography yeah, at hold on hold, hold on there um, you're presupposing something here, Mitch, and uh, you're presupposing that there is a high bar of intelligence in the average record company, and I hate to burst that bubble <laughs> if you're holding on to it, but there is not necessarily that fact there. 
I mean, you know, and, and another guy who whose work I loved was a guy called Ed Culver. And I got Ed to shoot some things that people were going, why are you using Ed Culver? All he does is shoot punks somersaulting off stages. And I'm going, he's an artist with a camera, you know, and Mark is an artist through the camera. And, you know, I had another thing to work around too, because um, uh, in hindsight and talking to one or two people, apparently Axel was a bit of a control freak, I'm told. And he had his pet photographer, Robert John, um, lovely guy. I really liked Robert, um, but he wasn't a Mark. He wasn't that good with a camera. And you want people like Mark around because they get those great live shots, but also they get those shots that tell a bit of a story and a bit of a history. And it's all well and good to demand the promotional eight by 10. But what Mark has, has and what is, what is evidence in the book is the aspect of the historian that he is and that he tells a bit of a tale. Um, you know, I, I smiled when he said it took seven years to get the book together. I'm going, damn, I'm surprised he went through all your photographs in that time. I mean, there must be gazillions of them. Especially yeah. back. And just, and just to step into the, uh, you know, you were talking about Robert John. I, I'll tell you a funny story. Not funny, but interesting. Um, and I did tell it in the book, I believe. Um, my first shoot with uh, Guns N' Roses, uh, I believe Hip Parader wanted me to do a shoot. This is before the album even came out. And they were like, they were the, the buzz was out. And Bryn Bridenthal, who's uh, I shot with Motley Crue a few years back for, uh, the, you know, over the years. And she's, you know, she, I went through her to set it up and she like kind of had to, had a fight tooth and nail because, you know, she and she told me she goes they have their photographer they're his friend they're, it's like they're you know they don't want to shoot with anyone else but him and then Bryn told me she had to like really say look you know he, Robert's fine and everything you know it's but you really got to start you know opening it up you know Mark can bring some other stuff to the table and he's got some you know every camera's differently every eye is different so you know you got to be open and she really fought tooth and nail for me and then you know she got me to shoot and that first shoot like they didn't want to be there. And then, and Robert was there too, you know, you know, watching and, and I try to befriend him cause I had a photo agency and I really try to, I wanted to help him be a, a photographer and, you know, have some success, not just rely on a band, one band. Like, you know, I was going to hook him up with other bands and, you know, but he didn't have any interest cause I was, you know, stepping on his turf and all that. So, you know, during the shoot, Axel wouldn't even look at me and he actually gave, he gave me the finger <laughs> Uh, and put it on his uh, his leg, and and he had a he had a, on his leg. He wrote "Glam sucks," and you know I got him to look at me once in a while. It was a quick twenty thirty minute photo shoot, and we we got the photos, and they're in the book. And then uh, just ironically enough, my last photo shoot with Guns N' Roses, as they are, um, he gave me the finger. That's what made it on the cover. So it's kind of like a full circle, isn't it? You know, but you know. <laughs> Anyway, that's, well, that, that was my, uh, my Mark, story. Mark, back in the day, I don't know if you were aware of this, but uh, one of the things Axel used to do when he was um, obliged to let somebody rather than Robert John take pictures, um, the transparencies would obviously come through to, uh, you know, for him to go through and choose which ones that he would approve. He used to take a pin and stick it through the ones he didn't like and, you know, right. trying to explain to him, dude, that's not cool. You know, you don't yeah. do that to photographers. Um, but, you know, it's just, just a little indicator of the kind of mindset we had to work with back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Well, hey. well we, uh, you know, he, was, we were, he wasn't the only one that did that. But, um, but uh, it, actually, from that photo shoot, we developed this relationship because they kind of liked me. I wasn't, you know, I, I give everyone their space, especially when they're like that. I, I want to earn their trust. And I want to be there the next time and the next time. And and when they came to New York, when they did that uh, that run in uh, CBGBs and all that, Bryn set up a photo shoot. Um, they came up to my studio. EZO was playing too. Uh, they were I had them in my studio, and and Axel liked them. They were label mates, so I did a little shoot with them together. And you know, it was another quick shoot. It, no one wanted to be there. And then once we got the CBGBs, it was fun and games. You know, I had them. You know, you know, everyone was in a good mood, and it was like out of the you know, it was in their environment. And, 
And I documented all that, and that's when we became kind of close. And then when I was out with Motley, they opened up, and uh, it, the rest is history. Uh, we yeah. mentioned a couple of uh, photographer, a couple of other photographers there. So I, I have this curiosity: was it sort of a brotherhood of photographers that would hang around, or was it a cutthroat business where if you saw, and I'm not going to start naming names, but you saw the other guy, you just went. Oh, you're not getting this fucking shot from me. This is my, like, no. h- how was it? Yeah, back no, then? I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll name names because it's no, you know, there was, I, I feel like in every, every decade, there was like three photographers that like really nailed it. Like, you know, did that genre. And I feel like in the eighties, uh, that those, that music, it was me on the East coast. I was the youngest one. Then there was Ross Halfin cause he had his connections with with Kerrang and my my I, my connections in the beginning was with Circus, so it's important to have a magazine behind you to get access to let them to get to know you. And then Niels Lozauer on the West Coast uh, was uh, you know a little bit more established from Van Halen and whatnot. So everyone worked with us, but the managers never wanted us together. And and we would we did you know it's not like we didn't hate each other, but. You know, whenever someone would do a video shoot or something special, an album cover, we all wanted it. So I fought the hardest, and I believe I kind of won on a lot of that stuff. I I did a lot of album covers where I, I you know, that that became kind of iconic in the, in the decade and specialty shoots. I was more of a concept guy, you know, that I really wanted to create. You know, where those guys are just more, you know, good road photographers and you know, portrait guys. Um, I just wanted, I always wanted to like kind of have an Annie Leibovitz type of thing going just with my rock and roll stuff, smoke and, you know, the typical stuff. It's cliche, you know, smoke and, and gels, you know, that was my thing. But uh, it was a sign of times. And, uh, you know, now we see each other and we're all, we're all cool. You know, I saw Neil on a cruise and we're hanging out and telling stories, but, you know, it was a, it was a good, to me, it kept us all on our toes. Uh, I don't know how they feel about it, but me being a very competitive person, wanting everything, you know, I, I would, you know, sometimes I got, I remember I, I, I found out Van Halen was doing a video in LA and I was in, in there and Neil was shooting and I knew he was, but I had a relationship with Van Halen too, but his was stronger, obviously from the, the early days. And I really wanted to be at that shoot, or maybe it was just David Lee Roth solo. And, uh, you know, Neil was there doing all his thing and all that, but I just showed, I got, I didn't, I didn't get a no and I didn't get a yes. So I was like, all right, they're there. I'm going to go there and, you know, see if one of the guys in the band see me and then I can start talking to them and then get in that way. So it didn't work. They cut me off at the pass, you know, on that one, you know, so that, that happens. So I'm a fighter, you know, I, I, it, you know, if, if you don't go, you don't know is what I always say, you know, you got to try it out. I, I'm not going to be like, I, I'm not going to say I'm not going to be pushy, but I don't use, I don't like the word pushy, but I'm going to be, as foregoing uh oh come on mark you're an east coast guy you're an east coast guy (laughs) mark you're not you're not going to take a an indifferent la no and go and accept it you're an east coaster you're going to put your shoulder in there and go okay i'm here i want to i want a definite no and I, i and i want it from the horse's mouth i don't want it from a publicist unless i have to you know and i'm respectful but they have to be respectful for me too just get the word out to the artists, like, I really want to be there. If they don't want me there, I'm cool, you know? But, you know, I, I play by the rules. I'm politically correct, but when I get, you know, fucked around a little bit by not giving an answer, like, just give me an answer and give me a good answer. The answer that makes sense to me, you know? Like, you know, we hired Niels Lozauer. You can't be on. You don't just skirt around it. It's cool. I get it. I do the same thing. And by the way, you, you mentioned the three, for, for me, the three greatest rock photographers ever. I mean, I just, the, what these guys have done is just fantastic. Um, I want to ask you just real quick about the the modern age of photography, because now, you know, back then you took a picture, it went in Circus Magazine, and it went on a cover, now you take a picture and it shows up somewhere and then it becomes a Google image and then anybody can download it and, and use it. And, and you're like, no, you can't just use it. It's, it's mine. And yet they do. Uh, how, does, how has that affected your business? And, and how do you do, how do you protect what is rightfully yours? Well, it's actually a blessing in disguise because it, unfortunately there's no magazines and you want to show your pictures out, out for the fans. And it's cool for the fans to, to take them and, I always encourage them, you know, to 
you know, put them on their sites and everything. But if it's a if it's an online publication that's making money advertising and whatnot, they're supposed to buy them, whether it's from an agency or or the photographer. And it's not a lot of money either. You know, they don't like, you know, they don't pay a lot of money for an image on, you know, on a website. It could be five, ten bucks sometimes. It's ridiculous. So I don't really go that route. So they just feel it's easier to just take stuff there and throw it together. So they probably hire um, uh, someone, some kid or something to get images and, and however they got them, they got them. And what happens is they put them up and if, and if it's a company that's it's a real company, then I have a copyright attorney uh, basically, you know, sue them. And, you know, and, and before I actually go to court, we make a settlement and you make more money that way than being in the, getting in the magazine. <laughs> so it, it, I call, I call, I call them ambulance chasers. So I put in my best work. I'm like, take them, take them. You, you know, if you use them, you're going to be in trouble. That's that, that's the one thing with the internet, uh, the internet as being a, a content creator. Cause you know, I do my interviews and stuff and then people take them and repost them. And you're like, ah, oh, could you give me well, a few bucks well, for the, it? <laughs> the, the, there is another thing there. Yeah. Um, Mitch in the, you know, if if you go on, you know, do a mass Google of images, you'll find there are certain images where there's a very large imprint of who owns the copyright across it. So you have to get in touch with that particular copyright holder to be able to use that image if you want to. I mean, you can protect yourself a little bit there. But the bottom line is, yeah, everybody's got a phone and everybody's ca got a camera. Um, and lots of people own guitars doesn't mean to say they can write a song. Um, you know, great photographers have not just an eye. It's, it's what, watching them work. It's really interesting because there seems to be a moment where um, that decision to push, push the button is made. And it's, it's almost, almost got an energy through it. It's, it's a moment of magic that that person has with the camera in their hand when they choose to push that button. And there are some people who are really adept at it, and there are an awful lot of people who aren't. We have I mean, yeah. we we have lost that art. You know, you look back at those pictures that Ross took, that Neil took, that Mark took, and there really was an art to it. Now you look at concert photography that shows up in your local newspaper or even your even your dailies, and it really is just some some guy that just said, "Hey, go take a couple of pictures with your phone and send them in," and it's just like, hmm. Wow, there's there's a sort of lost mystique in that. Um, Mark, just real quick, you've worked with obviously everybody in the business. We, you know, the Motley Crews, the Ozzy Osbournes, the Metallicas, the Twisted Sisters. Was there anyone in particular where, when you got the call, you just went, "Fuck yeah, I can't wait to be on that bus with them again." Was there one, or or did they, or did they they sort of all have a little special place in your life? No, it was every it was everybody. Like I like. See, with the bands, like they go on this tour, you know, whether it's with an, uh, an opening band or as an opening band or or their own tour. And I would just like go out like a week or two at a time. I would never be on like a full tour, you know. I mean, that would be boring, you know. So I, I was like, I was like the, you know, I'd go out. They say, oh, White Sky's here. And then, you know, they they get some energy and, you know, be, it would break up their, you know, mundane, you know, day, day after day. And. And I'd add to the party and add a little bit of spice, you know, and I'm also the guy that was in the audience in the photo pit, you know, finding all the girls too to hang out with after the show. Cause uh, you know, that, that was uh, something that I would always, you know, help them with if they needed some help. So, uh, you know, they, it, it was just, it was fun. I, every band that I worked with and I toured with, I would, then I would go out with Dawkin and then, Three weeks later, I'm out with Rat, and then I see the same girls. Like you know, so I would know the girls. I know, I, you know, I, I would, I you know had this little black book, and you know I'd write down the the you know the town they were in, and then when I was in the town with another band, I would just you know hook up the band. I said, oh, and, you know, I'd give them their numbers and have them come backstage, and you know the usual. So it was it was fun for me, you know. It was just, yeah. And then I yeah. and then I would go and bring the magazine from the last time I shot them or bring pictures. So, you know, it it was cool. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, just real quick, Alan, I'm going to talk about your favorite band, uh, Kiss. Th there is this great story of how in 1977, outside of Madison Square Garden, you are selling, I guess, 
kiss pictures and you get arrested. Uh, what was the circumstance of that? And, and was, was it sort of kiss behind it where they had attorneys or some, or, or guys looking out, you know, road crew guys? Or was it just random police activity where they said, ah, we're going to go get some bootleggers? So talk to me about that. Well, no. Alan loves Kiss stories. Yeah. Well, it, it's just um, it's, it's just some bands are more strict than others. And obviously Kiss at the time, they wanted to make all the money on their T-shirts and whatever else merch was being sold. So they put the word out like the, the cops don't really they don't really care. It's more work for them and all that. So unless they get like, you know, someone up from the superior saying, you know, we got to clean this out, you know, because Kiss's security is like looking out and they're seeing shirts inside the place that aren't theirs and it pisses the management off. And then, you know, everyone gets in trouble, security and whoever else. So I guess in that case, you know, I was selling pictures out of my high school locker. And then at night I go to the concerts. I like to stay up all night. Go to, When there's a band that played three nights, I would, you know, take pictures, sell them for a buck a piece on the train in my high school and then in front of the concerts. And, you know, there was, I ended up getting arrested for selling the pictures and I was in the paddy wagon with the shirt sellers and all that. And, you know, at the end of the, in the morning, he said, you know, if you want your pictures back, you got to appear before the judge. And I'm like, that's all right. Just keep the pictures. And, you know, and that was, a you know, from then I went to circus magazine. I just picked up the magazine and, you know, looked at my subscription, looked at the address, and I, I just went there the next day with my photographs, and I asked to talk to the art director, and the secretary kind of liked me and told me to wait around until he comes out, and then I talked to him for about 20 minutes. They liked me, and they told me to shoot with this and do that, and then, you know, six months later, Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, and Journey were playing Giant Stadium, and, and Aerosmith wasn't really letting photographers in, so uh, I stuck my camera in again, and... Um, got some great shots and left them at the office. And two months later, it was the centerfold of Steven Tyler. Uh, Beatles were on the cover, 1978. And then from then on, they started running all my pictures of Aerosmith, Ted Nugent, Charity. And then I started my relationship. And then from then on, I just, any door that opened, I would just, you know, break it down as, you know, opened it up as much as possible. And then I started meeting managers. Steven saw my photos in the magazines and liked them. And then I started working with Lieber Krebs and they had ACDC and the Scorpions. And it just, you know, it just all snowballed like crazy. I love that. That's the gorilla part of rock and roll, Mark. Power to you. I love that story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wait, wait, <laughs> did you, did you like a kiss story, Alan? Is that what I'm hearing? I knew I, I knew I'd, I'd, no, I'd wear I'd, you no, down. No, no, Mitch, don't get carried away. <laughs> what I'm liking here is a Mark Weiss story. Kiss are just, Whatever, you know, <laughs> that was a Mark Weiss story. Well, based around Kiss, yeah. but we're, we're almost there. Uh, Mark, just real quick. Uh, you, are, of course, are credited with uh, introducing Zach Wilde to Ozzy Osbourne. But I want to know is, where did your relationship with Zach start out? Was he just a, a local guy that you were shooting at the, the, the bars and the high schools and you became friends? Or did you hear people talking about him and go, okay, who's this guy? And... How did that sort of come about? It's called fate. Like you couldn't have, you know, you couldn't have wrote it in the movie. So the night before I was with Ozzy and Sharon, I was doing a photo shoot. And then afterwards we, she wanted to go check out a guitar player in Long Island. So I went out, went with him with my friend, Dave. And then, uh, Ozzy was like plastered and he's like, that's my guy. I want him. And he wasn't the guy, you know, didn't have the look, nothing. And, you know, I told Sharon, I'll keep my eyes open. And then literally the next day, um, uh, I told my friend, uh, face to meet me at this club. And I said, uh, he's like, no, nah, I'm tired. I'm not going. I said, well, I'm going to go there. Don't, you know, I'm going to go have a drink. I don't know who's playing. So long story short, he went, I fell asleep in front of the, the TV and, and then he called me the next day. He said, Mark, I found the guitar player. I'm like, what? He goes, I found him. I said, come on, really, Dave? He's like, no, really. He's like, I said, well, you know, come to my studio. Bring him. Ozzy's coming to look at my pictures. If you really think, well, what the hell? So <laughs> he brings Zach to my studio. Zach brings a, a tape. He made a tape. He brought his, brought his guitar and his amp. And we were kind of waiting for Ozzy to audition. I, you know, and I haven't even heard him. I just trusted my friend Dave Feld. And he was there for hours and hours. And another long story short, midnight comes. Sharon keeps calling me every hour or two. 
we're going to be there. We're going to be there. Uh, and I told her, I said, you know, I got this guitar player and he's, you know, he's really good. And meanwhile, I'm listening to him practice and I really was good and he looked cool as hell. I'm doing a photo shoot with him, keeping busy. And so at midnight, she goes, we ain't coming. We got to be in England tomorrow. Ozzy and Andre the Giant, they just drank each other under the table. They're both passed out. And, and then that was it. And then the next day I left a tape and a photo of Polaroid. And when they got to England, they said, bring them. And I, me and Zach went to L.A. a few weeks later. He didn't get it right away. And then I took him, brought him back again. And then he got the gig, obviously. And then the rest is history. And, and fate, you know? Yeah, and what a great history. Now, uh, we're, we're at the half hour mark, so I'm just going to say this. Um, what was it like for you to to work with Alan Niven? What kind of sort of relationship <laughs> did you have with him? And 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 what kind of access did he give you? And, and you know, how thankful are you yeah. to, <laughs> of Alan? Well, he let me do what I wanted to do because I guess he felt that the guys – you know, he wanted what the guys wanted. He wanted to make sure that they were happy. And he saw that they didn't hate me, you know? So he let me be there. And I'm sure Alan, when I was taking that picture, I mean, you didn't know I was there, but if you did know I was there, you would probably tell me to get out. But so I knew, I knew where, where to go. And especially with Alan, cause I know he didn't take on a lot of new people in the, in the circle. So you know, he, you know, we had a good relationship. Uh, I wasn't a real talkative guy back then. I was shy and my camera kind of like helped me get out of it. So it was, kind of my, it was kind of my security blanket, you know, and you can, your camera did the, the, your camera yeah. did the talking there, Mark. And, uh, you know, what a terrible question to ask Mitch, poor guy, put him on the spot like that. Well, but I'll come back that, to what I said before. That's what we do here. Um, There were two things about Mark that I recognized. One was that he knew how to handle himself and would not, you know, that was a a real important thing around certain bands. And the other thing was, was he was capable of catching the picture that wasn't the standard seat chucking, uh, cheek sucking pose. He could catch the band. And he had that ability to take that photograph that, spoke more than the standard pose a picture. And that's the kind of person that you want to have around. Absolutely. And, and fortunately, and Alan let me be that person. You know, you got to have that, per, you know, he, he, was in, he was in control. He, like, he could have he could have said, Mark, leave, you know, but he trusted me. And, and then after that, I, I, if someone is on my side, I, I do more for them. You know, like I go, you know, I, I'm a pleaser. And I have nothing to gain to be like obnoxious or loud, like some of the other photographers out of the three, you know, we all have our own style and, you know, I'm not that guy, but that's who I am. And that's who they are. And for whatever reason, they like the three of us, yeah, you, you know, and, and yeah, the, Mitch, you would never ask Ross Halfen how he thought of me. Um, that would, that was definitely <laughs> chalk and cheese, me and Ross or any. Um, or anybody, on the other hand, <laughs> yeah. On, on the other hand, I knew him to be a professional, and he took a couple of amazing pictures over, over the years of the band. But uh, um, Ross was not necessarily someone I'd be inviting back to the hotel if you follow me. Whereas Mark, hey, let's go. Yeah. And by the way, Alan, I'll throw this at you. Rob Halford said of Mark and of the book that his pictures say as much as the music. Now, to me, that's that's one hell of a statement because the music conveys emotion. And when when you got the metal god saying that your pictures are just as important, that's pretty cool. Oh, totally it is. But you got to you got to keep something in mind about Rob Halford. Go ahead. Rob, Rob Halford. Rob Halford became the lead singer of Judas Priest, so as he could wear that stuff twenty four seven. Well, true. Uh, on that, uh, Mark, an absolute pleasure. And folks, the the decade that rocked the photography of Mark Weiss, wise a wise guy, great Weiss, book. great book. You can get it now. Um, merci, as we say in Montreal. Thank you so much, and and thank you for all these great pictures because uh, my walls back then, holy mackerel. Filled with Mark Weiss photography. You know, I also want to uh, close on this. I I developed uh, a little uh, like a Netflix series. It's gonna be. It's called The Weiss Guy, and I got like one episode up, and I'm trying to like get some uh, 
you know, get some more going. And it's just about these, these guys from the eighties that stalk the wife's guy. So it's kind of funny. It's like, you know, eighties, uh, in today's time. So take a look at that. Where do we find that? Is it, is it on Netflix or is it on YouTube? No, it's just on, it's on my YouTube channel. The, the decade that rocked has a whole bunch of things. So the, the trailer's up there, the episode's up. And, uh, once we start, once we can start working together, we're going to do some more, we're going to start doing some flashback scenes, you know, like me when I was younger and then them when they were younger and how they used to bother me back then kind of. So we're trying to, we're working that out, but there's always that flashback stuff is always good, especially when it's eighties. So you got, you, good fun stuff. Something to do. By the way, just real quick, uh, before I let you go on the Bon Jovi slippery when wet, there were two covers, one, you know, the, the infamous band cover, did you shoot both covers or did you only shoot the one with the, the water and the garbage bag? Well, there was actually five covers. And oh, hey now. You'll see. <laughs> hey now. There's, uh, it, was, it was supposed to be called Wanted, you know, Wanted Dead or Alive, where right. they dressed up like cowboys and all that. So that was the first one. Then we had some kid dress up like, a, like John when he was little. So like, you know, with a cowboy outfit. Again, the Wanted theme. And then when they went to Slippery When Wet, um we did the car wash scene and the girl and then they still wanted to do something suggestive. And they, the art director, uh, spent $2,000 on a bar of soap and put slippery and wet in it. And then just had her like rubbing her hands. We hired this other, this model for a thousand dollars for an hour hand model. And it was, I can believe it was such a joke. And that's, in, that's the first time it's, it's ever been seen, which is in the book. And then we did the garbage can. So that's, I think that's five. That's five. And and by the way, I, I think that, that that cover, the last one, the one that became the cover, sort of saved the band. Because had they done one of those other ones, which respectfully were sort of cheesy, they might have been known as yeah. a cheesy band going forward. And I think by the time 89 rolled, would have rolled around, they would have been like, ah, you know, they're one might of these. Might have been known as a cheesy band. They are an awesome band. Don't get me started. But no, but uh, but I but it just it just goes to show the power of imagery that the wrong image, you know, the the girl with the soap. I mean, that would have just been hokey. And yet this one, yep. it was understated, and yet it was absolutely perfect. So you know, uh, merci, Monsieur Allen. Any last words? No, no last words, but except to say it was a pleasure to talk with you again, Mark. It's been too long, and I maybe if I ever get myself off the mountain and get over to the East Coast, I sincerely hope there's a cocktail or two in that with us. Absolutely. Thank you, boys. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Ever wonder what Vince Neal would sound like if he was a black belt in Taekwondo? <laughs> what about what his favorite McDonald's menu item is? <laughs> Just hold the pickles. This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFun.